You've probably heard me say that entrepreneurship is a paradox. We're confident, yet we're insecure. We think we have all the right answers, but we know we don't know all that much. Looking back, there are certain books that I really wish I would have read before I started Watch Mojo. In 2006, I got my hands on this book. The publisher, Henry Luce and his American Century, is the story of Time Incorporated, which went on to publish Life, Time, Fortune, SI, and many other brands. But in this series, where we look at books we wish we would have read sooner, we're not gonna start off with the publisher, because in reading this, I realized I had to go back throughout history and get to know the OG first. That's right, the chief. The life of William Randolph Hearst, the original gangster of media. Growing up, I had a very hard time reading books. For one, I was very impatient, and two, I had a short attention span. But I made that up by reading a lot of articles, and I had this encyclopedia-like knowledge base just by spending hours and hours devouring articles on famous people and events and stories throughout history. I've always liked biographies, so it shouldn't come as a surprise that as I got older and I was kind of navigating throughout the entrepreneurial uh, roadmap, I started to kind of be drawn towards biographies of builders of media companies. I'd already read the publisher on Henry Luce, who was the founder of Time Inc., and that's when I realized that I had to go back and actually learn a bit more about William Randolph Hearst. I'd known about Hearst, you know, his name was synonymous with yellow journalism and sensationalist stories that are kind of commonplace today, whether it's on, you know, National Enquirer, People, or BuzzFeed. When I kind of ordered this on Amazon and I received it, I was actually quite intimidated by the sheer brick-like size of it. But when I look at this book, I have very, very fond memories of it because I read this on my first trip to Greece in 2016. Two weeks out in the sun, on the beach, I devoured this. Today, when I look back at the book, there are seven distinct themes that rise to the surface. Number one, William Randolph Hearst was by no means a self-made man. For one, his father, who was a politician, ended up acquiring or inheriting, so to speak, the San Francisco Examiner due to a gambling debt that somebody owed to him. With her senior not necessarily being a big fan or passionate about media, eventually he gave the examiner to his son, William Randolph. In 1887, William Randolph Hearst and his partner, Mitchell Trubbett, ended up taking ownership of the paper. Soon thereafter, Hearst began to expand his media empire by moving to New York and buying the New York Journal. That's when he unleashed one of the first epic battles in business, taking on Joseph Pulitzer's New York World. Now, William Randolph Hearst wasn't exactly very good at finances, and we'll get back to this. And over time, he wasn't only given the paper by his dad, but his mom actually even lent him $10 million, a fortune then and now. Number two, he was a master of storytelling and marketing. One of the things that struck out with William Randolph Hearst, and later on you also see this in others like Rupert Murdoch, is as much as they were very good at the big vision, they also paid a lot of attention to details. William Randolph Hearst looked at margins, font size, font type, colors. The term yellow journalism, if you're wondering, actually refers to literally the color and quality of the paper that Hearst used in his newspapers. But figuratively speaking, yellow journalism refers to Hearst, through his paper, egging on the government to take on Spain due to what Spain was doing in Cuba. But while he carried his influence by talking about politics, what moved papers was the sensational stories about humans and crime and sex that he basically peddled in his newspapers. At its peak, Hearst oversaw a news empire that had a presence in 30 cities, reached 20 million consumers, but then the Great Depression kneecapped his empire, leading his mother to lend him $10 million to try to stabilize it. Number three, he was a bit of a ladies' man and that spilled over onto his business empire. He was married to a gal named Millicent Wilson, but he ended up falling in love with an actress named Marion Davies. Eventually, his affection for Marion Davies led him to take articles that appeared in Cosmopolitan magazine, which belonged to him, and adapt it into things that would become movies. Now, what Hearst didn't really like as much about the movie business is that it had a very different ROI and payback period than the investment he was pouring into print. He ended up partnering with Paramount to launch what became known as Cosmopolitan Productions. But eventually, he cut his losses and retreated, and today, remnants of Cosmopolitan are present in modern-day MGM. Now, what's interesting about that, and the book does a fantastic job of this, is you see that some of the same hesitation and trepidation that Hearst 
experience trying to move from print into the movie business is, is exactly what future media companies face when they try to venture into the internet. Four, his many dalliances in the political world. If you're wondering about the thickness and density of the book, it's because the book does a pretty good and thorough job of looking at Hearst's dalliances in politics. Hearst today is known mainly for his success in business, but he had a very mixed degree when it comes to politics. Hearst was twice elected as a Democrat to the House of Representatives, but he failed when he ran for president in 1904. He also failed twice running for the mayor of New York City in 1905 and 1909, and the governor of the state of New York in 1906. One reason why he failed is because throughout his life, he went from being a Democrat to a Republican, becoming a staunch opponent of Roosevelt's, FDR's, New Deal in the 30s. One of the things I love about reading history books is finding out how society conducted itself in a given era. Five, walking a fine line between wealth and financial ruin. Hearst himself was a paradox. At one time, he was obscenely wealthy. Yet at another, he was on the verge of financial despair. Hearst had a fine taste for art. He had a massive art collection. He started to build this castle overlooking the Pacific Ocean in California. And he also had quite an extravagant lifestyle. But it wasn't so much his spending that got him in trouble. What actually got him in trouble was his criticism of Roosevelt's New Deal. As I mentioned, over the course of his life, he went from a Democrat to a Republican, and as much as President Roosevelt and his New Deal was popular, his criticism of it ended up turning off a lot of his readers. Another example of a paradox is the fact that Hearst himself wasn't a drinker, even though his mistress slash girlfriend Marion Davies was. She experienced a lot of challenges with the bottle. But what's really interesting about the social aspect of it is, Hearst would have these elaborate dinners and have the best foods and the best wines served. And his guests would usually start off their stay at his castle, sitting in the middle of the table. And over the course of the ensuing days, they would see that their position had kind of slid towards the end of the table. And once you got to the end of the table, eventually you'd go back and realize that, oh, my bags are packed, it's time for me to leave. Now, what would accelerate that is if one day you drank too much and said or did something that was foolish. In that scenario, you would go back to your room and see that, oh, somebody has already packed my bags, it's time for me to leave. So coming out of the 30s and the Great Depression, his financial situation got worse and worse. What helped him? Not surprisingly, World War II. World War II made advertising revenue skyrocket, and even though he had to take a million dollar loan from his mistress Davies, eventually his empire came back. Six, Citizen Kane. Orson Welles' Citizen Kane is widely seen as one of the greatest movies of all time. Ironically, even though William Randolph Hearst himself profited very handsomely from writing up about other notorious, famous, popular people, when he got wind that Orson Welles was developing a movie based loosely on himself, he went to great depths to try to crush the movie. The book does a pretty good job of explaining the paranoia and admittedly hypocrisy that Hearst manifested when he went after Wells. Seven, Hearst Media and William Randolph Hearst's legacy. As someone who's worked in media, it's impossible not to hear the name Hearst early on. Hearst today is known not only for its fantastic magazines, which have evolved pretty admirably into digital properties, but also because it expanded through Hearst TV and investments in broadcasting. One of the reasons why Hearst has done really well was ironically the foresight that Hearst had. Even though practically all of his children went on to become writers and dabbled in the media world, Hearst did something that was very intuitive. He set up a trust which actually forbid his children and his grandchildren from running the Hearst organization. He actually went out and recruited professional executives to run the operation and basically enabled family members to serve on its board. That ensured that professional managers would take care of the company while profits and dividends would be paid out to future generations. Today, Hearst is arguably the strongest it's ever been. One reason for that was the smart investment it made in ESPN. ESPN is 20% owned by Hearst, and that fat, juicy dividend that ESPN pays out allowed Hearst to further diversify into the 21st century. Today, Hearst also has a B2B business, operates assets in health, and many other things that I don't even think William Randolph Hearst would have ever dreamed of being in. That's been this episode of Books I Wish I Read Sooner. Have you read this book? What do you think of it? And what's a book you wish you'd read sooner?